Okay. Uh, I am absolutely, <clears throat> apparently my thread doesn't, but uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our next speaker who has uh, been a dear friend and supporter for many years, um, Joy Hirsch from Yale School of Medicine. Thank, thank you, Peter. And I also want to join the other speakers in thanking the organizers for this um, awesome uh, workshop today. Now, my contribution to this is going to be um, a voice from the trenches, actually. Um, and these are the trenches of uh, learning to do multimodal imaging in the field of a very new type of uh, question and technology. And that is the um, um, exploration of imaging two people simultaneously in natural interactive conditions. Now, it, sort of as a way of a caveat, um, this work is, is very new. And so I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about um, opportunities for multimodal imaging. I'm also going to validate a lot of the things that we're saying because this is a very new area. And I want to convince you that it's a very solid area, it's a very fruitful area for future research, uh, but we are at the very, very beginning of it. Now, I'm going to start my preamble with, um, well, with a slide, hopefully. Um, hmm. Oh. We uh, seem to be. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll start my preamble um, with the um, um, evident, some, with with what is absolutely evidently obvious that um, humans are a profoundly um, a social species, and um, these live interactions between us involve primary social cues, um, oftentimes uh, facial expressions and eye-to-eye -eye contact, which is why these things are so important for us to study, as, as Ina and others have already talked about. This is true uh, throughout the entire um, lifespan, um, and yet, be, even though these, these particular social cues, face and uh, uh, expressions are so important in the natural condition, we know very little about how our brains perform these, these social functions. Um, we know that this is a very important question because it is conserved across the animal kingdom. Um, this suggests also that these primary social cues are um, um, involved in very low level sensory systems um, probably bundled in some unique fashion to accommodate the natural interactions. Now, we know a little bit about the social system of the brain, and um, um, Ina has just done a beautiful job of uh, talking to us about the first really important fact, and that is that faces are important. Um, the um, uh, early, one of the early experiments that documented this, which is a classic now, was by Nancy Kanwisher um, and colleagues who did this very famous uh, functional MRI experiment comparing um, responses to faces and objects and confirming that indeed there was uh, real estate in the fusiform gyrus that was particularly sensitive to faces. Later, um, and more recently, uh, this type of work has been confirmed over and over and over again. But I want to point out this also um, the electrophysiology um, by Chang and So, who recently have made really important headway in understanding the code for facial identity. And this is done with single unit recordings of the, of the primate, with the main finding being that cells um, are also very specialized for face descriptions. So faces are important. In addition to that, we know that um, the um, temporal parietal junction, or what we lovingly refer to as the TPJ on the right side of the brain, also has a particularly unique sensitivity to social um, uh, stimuli. And this, um, I'm illustrating that point here by a uh, meta-analysis that was published um, um, recently, 
uh, not too recently, 2013, by Carter and Hoytel, uh, where they summarized 4,000 studies that talked about things social. And the bottom line is that the sweet spot here in the temporal parietal junction is one that we should keep our eyes on as an area that is sensitive to social cues. But the big problem here is that these conventional experimental approaches do not measure natural and spontaneous social interaction. So we would like to sort of get at that. The long-term goal is I'd like to understand the neural underpinnings of live social interactions. So specifically in this talk, I'm going to use eye-to-eye -eye contact between dyads as a measure of natural and spontaneous social interactions. That seems like a very humble beginning, but it is a start. Live interpersonal interactions, eye to eye. I'm going to employ a multimodal, multimodal research approach, um, um, and we're going to see um, these, these events from several points of view, and my goal is to integrate them for you in some kind of coherent model-based model approach. So here's the roadmap of my talk. We start with two people, and they are in actual contact. Now, eye-to-eye -eye contact or in some control or simulation related to that. We're going to simultaneously measure EEG, neuroimaging during, using FNIRS, and eye tracking on both people. And we're going to do that in the service of understanding models of the visual cortex, spatial processing system, and the social system um, during interpersonal interactions. I'm going to add to this matrix um, the eye tracking information in order to help us understand some of the basic dynamics that go on between the two brains during very simple eye-to-eye -eye contact. So stay tuned. Um, this is a um, slice of life in my lab uh, where we see two individuals being set up by a number of student helpers getting ready to do a near-infrared spectroscopy two-person interaction experiment. Now, I'm not going to spend um, any more time talking about the, um, the principles of optical imaging because Ted yesterday did an absolutely beautiful job of doing that for me. But I, so what I'm going to emphasize here are the things that Ted did not emphasize, although he did note that when you do full head coverage, that it is a real pain to set people up. Right, Ted? Okay. So um, this, this is it, but the guys have a lot of fun doing this. And this is basically the setup. People sit across the table from each other for these interactive experiments. And this is what Ted told you yesterday. It's a really beautiful study. Uh, it's really a beautiful sort of system of how we do this optical imaging. But I'm not going to skimp on this slide because I love raw data. And so even though Ted showed this to you yesterday, I'm going to show it to you again because I just love raw data. So here we see a proof of principle. This is one channel, one subject, one run. It's as raw as it gets, finger thumb tapping, um, alternating 15 second blocks of tap, 15 seconds of rest, tap, rest, tap, rest. And here's the oxy signal doing what a well-behaved hemodynamic signal does. It rises when you tap, it falls when you stop, it rises when you tap, and so on. We also have the advantage of collecting the deoxy signal, and as a well-behaved deoxy signal, signal, it falls when you tap, it rises when you rest, falls when you tap, and so on. And uh, we obtain both signals um, and as, um, in, in all of our experiments. And uh, in the event-triggered average, Ted showed you this yesterday, um, the oxy, deoxy, and its uh, congruence with the conventional fold signals. Okay. Now, this is a little bit different, though, than what Ted showed you because I'm showing you full head coverage, um, as, I said, as I said before. And the reason that we, of course, are doing this is that this type of, of, of technique, this imaging technology, allows us to do interpersonal in 
imaging in a live situation. So we don't have to put people in the scanner. We can let them sit across the table from each other and actually naturally interact. Um, we do uh, replicate the bold signals, which is very nice. We're dealing with well-behaved hemodynamic signals. This technique is reasonably tolerant of limited head movement. You can't jump up and down, but it's a lot more tolerant than the scanner. Our temporal resolution is about 30 milliseconds, but the spatial resolution is our big compromise here. Um, on the surface, we're imaging at about three centimeters, and depth, of course, is a little bit less than that. Here, we're showing you some of the details. Uh, this is, um, we're using the Shimatsu system. Um, I'm using eye tracking. Uh, with the Toby Pro, we're using active electrodes with the GTAC EEG system. Uh, we also have scene cameras and facial classification apparatus set up in, in this, uh, this um, uh, experimental paradigm. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about that today. We're going to stick with these through, but I just want to raise, just, just raise your, the level of awareness that we are doing facial expressions and so on as well in this paradigm. A little bit more detail here of the uh, layout that uh, embeds both the uh, EEG electrodes, these are the red things here, and the channel layout for the FMIRS optodes um, in a full head. Okay, so um, for the first part of this talk, and this, this is a, um, um, a, a proof of principle, actually, um, that uh, we actually can do, uh, when we know the answer, we can actually get the answer. So this is a replication experiment. Um, and so these, these, I'm not, these two people are not connected. We're doing a single subject replication just to show you that the system we're going to replicate the Nancy Canwisher experiment, the face object experiment, and I'm going to do it with simultaneous acquisitions of EEG and uh, neuroimaging. Um, we're going to look at, at the visual cortex and expect to see face processing in both of these both of these systems. This experiment, these data were just published by um, my MD PhD student, um, Swetha Dravita, in the, in the lab. Um, um, the first thing I want to point out here is that when we're combining EEG and FNIRS together, we have to change our paradigm slightly because the hemodynamic signal likes a block, and of course, EEG likes, likes events. And so here we compromise, and in this case, we have um, blocks of faces, but they're separate faces being presented in two seconds um, increments, and then we have object blocks, and in each of the blocks, face, object, object blocks, so we have a foil uh, of the other type of stimulus, and that's just for human factors so that our subjects don't get the idea that they're actually looking at uh, the same stimulus over and over again. So here, um, uh, is and, and, and Ina um, um, gave you a beautiful tour of the N170 specificity for faces. Um, we observed the N170 in almost um, all of our subjects, not all of them exactly for some reason, but almost all during the faces um, and um, objects, and that's just a well-behaved sort of signature of those effects. And in terms of the, the face-specific localization, we see faces greater than objects in both the deoxy and the oxy signal in the right um, fusiform gyrus area. Uh, more or less as expected, I take that as a, as a reasonable replication of the uh, findings that we expect. But in a, a multimodal approach, what we would like is not only to recapitulate what we already know, we would like to combine techniques together to understand something that we didn't understand before. So in this case, um, we um, isolate the, oscillate, the, the um, bands of oscillation in the EEG signal, and we um, do localization on it and ask which of the bands localizes to the areas that we have identified as specific to the faces. Um, and indeed, in this case, it is the theta band. So hold on to this idea. I'm going to um, uh, um, come back to this at the end of the talk. And as I go forward, I'm going to step up to the top of the menu now, and we're going to talk about live social interaction um, and how this, the, this paradigm and these techniques contribute to understanding uh, neural systems that are engaged in two 
um, in, in, in two-person uh, interactions. So um, the, the idea here is that um, we can test a very broad hypothesis, and this hypothesis was proposed by uh, De Jaeger and has been elaborated by uh, Leon Schilbert, um, Schilbach uh, uh, much more, more recently. Um, but the notion is that two interacting brains engage neural systems that are not engaged during the same task when it's done in a static or, or solo paradigm. So the idea is that there's something different when these brains are actually interacting as opposed to uh, when, when not. And so here's a sketch of that. The interaction involves brain circuitry that is not involved with the same task in non -interest. This is a hypothesis. And so we're going to test that. And so here, my first test of that hypothesis. And it goes like this. Now we connect our two people. They're sitting across the table from each other. They're doing an eye contact experiment, uh, which I'll explain in just a minute. We're going to test hypotheses. I'm not, I'm not going to do EEG here. I'm going to do the neuroimaging. And we're going to walk through the visual system. And we expect to see some unique activity associated with eye-to-eye -eye contact in these parts of the brain. So that's our hypothesis, and that's our, our prediction. Now, what do we do? The first thing that we do is um, we develop this face-to-face -face paradigm, and we computationally identify an eye box. So we, the eye box for each of these people is 3.3 by 1.5 degrees of visual angle around the eye box. And we compare the effects of an experiment of this kind with a control. And we actually, in this case, um, have people uh, looking at either a picture of a face, which is static, or a gaze at a video of a dynamic face. And I'm going to tell you about the video because it is a better control um, than the picture face, although the picture face experiment was published here in neuroimaging. Um, but we do this in two ways. Um, and there'll be a reason, I'll tell you why we have to do this in two ways in just a minute, it'll be obvious. But the first way <clears throat> is what I call a timed eye contact paradigm. <clears throat> and the eye contact with the partner is determined by the time series. Simply tell people when to look at each other and for how long. The second paradigm is the free viewing paradigm, and this is much more like the natural condition, where we let people actually look at each other as they feel comfortable doing. Um, so but the first one is sort of documents the validity of the second one in a way. So here it is, the timed eye contact paradigm, where, again, we have the blocks, 15 seconds on, off, rest, on, rest, on. And in the blocks, people look at each other for three seconds, and they look away. And that's because you can't look at each other for longer than three seconds. This is because people can't do the, any other task. So, so we have to design the task around people what do. So they look, and so the way we do that is that we have people sitting across the table from each other, and they look for three seconds, they're cued by a tone, and then they divert their gaze 10 degrees. Similarly with the, in this case, the um, face video, um, we um, um, have the uh, eye box calibrated, of course, so it's the same in both cases, and they look at the video or they look away, they divert their gaze um, 10 degrees. Okay, and we know that they can do that because we watch them with eye tracking and confirm that everybody does that. And in fact, the gaze patterns in the eye box don't vary depending on whether it's a real eye to eye or the eye to picture or the eye gaze. Now what we tell our subjects to do is to um, um, gaze on your partner's face and make sustained eye contact during the three second real face event. And that's what the eye tracking said that they did, and in, we tell the people to do the same thing for the video face condition. So the, what, do, what do we find? Um, here's the big kahuna, that when we compare the face-to-face -face condition with the video gaze condition, we observe this beautiful cluster of activity in this sweet spot predicted as the, as the social nexus in the TP, right TPJ includes the supramarginal gyrus, the superior temporal gyrus, and the angular gyrus. 
Um, just to be sure we got it right, of course we do the region of interest analysis comparing the, rate, the um, relative beta values of the real and the video condition for both the deoxy and the oxyhemoglobin signal. By the way, I'm show, showing always, um, when in doubt, you can assume that I'm showing always the deoxyhemoglobin signal because it is a signal that most likely, uh, that most replicates the uh, familiar bold signal from fMRI and it is the signal that is hardest to acquire because it is, has the smallest amplitude. Um, so we have biased our findings against our hypothesis. So when I don't say, assume that I am actually looking at the deoxyhemoglobin signal, although here I'm, I'm showing uh, both. Okay, so um, we have some evidence that actually supports our um, interactive brain hypothesis. Um, then, and it says that we might have specialized systems that uh, live within the right temporal parietal junction for that, that purpose. And so um, this is sort of like um, a, a summary of what I've just said, but it, um, it introduces also the second paradigm. So I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time with the free viewing paradigm. And so again, we have the 15 seconds of viewing, 15 seconds of rest, 15 seconds of viewing. And this time, sitting across the table from each other, these, um, our participants are simply listening to a narrative. So it's a little bit like sitting across the table with a friend listening to the radio. And this narrative that they're listening to um, is a little bit ridiculous. And so um, there's a, a bit of opportunities for emotive, for smiling, for going, oh my God, I can't believe that. Um, uh, that, that kind of thing. So they're listening to this narrative. Now, here we have engaged um, a, a new uh, instrumentation where we have what we call a smart glass. And so when the smart glass is open, it, we, we just send a pulse to it, and the glass opens or closes. It's the neatest thing. Um, so um, uh, during the viewing period, that glass is open, and then during the rest period, uh, the glass is closed. And we can um, then ask people to um, uh, make face contact with their partner in response to the audio recording with as natural and frequent eye contacts as possible. Okay? And then we ask them to do the same thing with the video face condition. And of course, this, this ridiculous narrative is playing um, all the time. So what do we observe in this case? Well, this is sort of the index spot, the TPJ. Same area is active. Um, um, but maybe a little bit more posterior, and including a robust cluster of the high-level visual activity from, the, from visual cortex, Roman's area 19, as you might expect. Now, one of the things I'm going to, um, one of the caveats here is that I, as I go farther down my talk, the error bars on my findings get larger and larger. Now, this is an experiment that is being done. Uh, we have uh, 16 uh, subjects here, that's almost enough. Generally, our results are quite stable by the time we have 16, 16 pairs. Um, so I feel very comfortable presenting it, but uh, this is uh, still uh, work in progress. So um, in general, we see pretty much the same uh, clusters as we saw in the, um, the, the um, timed eye contact. So there's, there's general congruence between the two of them. It's not exactly the same, but general congruence in that we're seeing right side superior marginal gyrus, superior temporal gyrus, and angular gyrus. Now, why in the world would we do this free viewing paradigm? Well, this is really cool because it gives us an experimental link to eye movement processes that might um, um, be come a little bit closer to underlying eye contact behavior. So I'm going to uh, use that paradigm to ask an additional question. What is the role of the live eye-to-eye -eye contact in this social network? So we're going to use the, this paradigm. And here I am um, showing um, kind of where I'm going to be um, in my roadmap. Two people, eye-to-eye -eye contact with eye tracking and gaze testing hypotheses about the uh, role of eye contact. So let me show you kind of what we do here. We first 
define what we mean by an eye contact. And in our hands, we say, and by the way, we just made this up. Um, you know, this is one, actually one of the neat things about doing something that's never been done before. You can just make it up. And nobody can say yes, but somebody else did it some other time. Nobody's done this before. And so um, this may not be right, um, but it is a start. So we, um, uh, we say that the eyes of both partners have to be simultaneously, and this is within eight milliseconds because that has to do with our frame rate here. We're um, doing eye tracking at 120 hertz. Um, and that they have to stay focused within the eye box of the other partner for a minimum duration of 83 milliseconds. Again, an arbitrary number that seems right to us and um, is based on our um, acquisition rate. So here's an example of two traces. This is S1, subject one and subject two, and they're looking, um, this is the glasses open in the green patches here, and then the glasses closed during the white, and we have an interline here that marks the um, moments of eye-to-eye -eye contact as defined here. So now I want to just blow this up a little bit for you. So I'm going to show you a patch of data just arbitrarily chosen from here that's going to have part of this blank area, part of that blank area, and then the full 15 seconds of the of open glass uh, free viewing paradigm. So here it is. This is um, the red and the blue lines are the two subjects. These are the, the blank areas. And here, this is when they're engaged in the uh, a free viewing um, experience. And so the, we mark the times when um, S2, actually S1 in this case, um, is actually has his or her eyes in the eye box of the partner. And similarly for S1, eyes in the eye box of the partner. And then we can define those moments of eye-to-eye -eye contact. Now, if we just take away the data here, uh, you can see that we actually have been able to determine the frequency of eye-to-eye -eye contact. Now, why in the world would we want to do that? Well, we can use the frequency of actual eye-to-eye -eye contact as a regressor and go back and look at our imaging data um, in relationship to the eye-to-eye -eye contact behaviors. And when we do that, um, what we see, um, and these are the data that I showed you before. These are, this is eye-to-eye -eye contact greater than eye-to video modulated by the frequency of eye-to-eye -eye contact. And so what we see here is a big patch of angular gyrus and again, the uh, visual uh, high-level broadness broad area. So what we lose is a supermarginal gyrus and the superior temporal gyrus. Um, and all of the um, um, areas on these, these two hemispheres of this brain um, represent patches that are uh, responsive to the regressor of the eye-to-eye -eye contact. And so here you see bilateral representation of the visual system. I don't know what these guys are doing up here. Um, again, this is uh, work in progress uh, with the um, N, of, N of 16 pairs. Okay, so here we are kind of back um, here. Um, um, I've sort of shown you how eye-to-eye -eye, uh, contact um, affects the social system. And so what's important about this diagram is no longer just a roadmap. It's a little bit, it's kind of a summary. And it says what we learned here is that we can connect eye movement behavior, eye to eye contact behavior to the social system of the brain. So these two guys now have a connection via the regressor that I just showed you uh, for the uh, neuroimaging data. And I think that that's a pretty exciting uh, a future direction. Now, I would like to um, move on to a deeper dive. Um, again, um, asking a question about how all of this relates to um, dynamic neural coupling. Now, dynamic neural coupling has been proposed as a real hallmark of the interactive brain. Um, and the definition of, in, of, of uh, neural coupling 
um, and this was proposed by Yuri Hassan some time ago, is that when neural signals between two acting brains are synchronized. And so um, um, the hypothesis that's associated with this is that um, the a time series okay um, the hypothesis is that um, these that areas that are um, uh, synchronous um, are actually sharing information and so the story is sort of a little bit like this you've got activity in some area of one brain uh, represented by a hemodynamic signal activity in, the, in another brain represented by a hemodynamic signal and the extent to which these signals are synchronous or coherent is the extent to which they are neurally coupled and that represents um, some kind of sharing of information. This is usually measured with uh, wavelet analysis and for those of you who might not be familiar with wavelet analysis, this is a very um, limited description of what it is, but essentially you take a complex signal from some patch of brain, generally bigger than a signal, sig single channel, um, maybe an anatomical area that includes two or three channels, um, and you decompose it into its fundamental wavelet kernels as illustrated here. Um, these wavelet components in seconds might be thought of as periods actually is another way of describing them. Um, and then we ask to what extent these kernels are correlated across two individuals. And so um, um, we have used this technique um, um, to test hypotheses of the kind that uh, Yuri Hassan has uh, suggested that these uh, coupling across brains represents a sharing of information. In this context, the hypothesis is that we would predict that the signals that we're observing during eye-to-eye -eye contact in the right TPJ would be more correlated during the eye-to-eye -eye contact than during the control. And we also predict that the angular gyrus and visual areas would be more synchronous in the free viewing context. So we can start this um, looking at the neural coupling um, with a very specific hypothesis. But before we do that, being um, somewhat uh, predisposed to testing everything before, testing all of our methods before we go into testing our hypotheses, um, um, we have um, validated or made an attempt to validate, we think we have validated, the fact that wavelet um, coherence um, is truly a measure of neural coupling. That is, the, it is the neural system that is coupling, not something like, say, a vascular system or movement or some other artifact. That it is indeed truly neural. And as being, being um, um, past vision scientists, of course we go back to the vision system and we um, do this testing with the reversing checkerboard. Isn't that a beautiful thing, a reversing checkerboard? It's so comfortable going back to doing experiments of, a cal of the calibration kind using reversing checkerboard. So what we do to validate that uh, the neural coupling is really neural um, is that we present the checkerboard in um, this case three different dynamic series um, as, as illustrated here, series one, two, and three. And then we run this series through a uh, we can convolve through through a convolution of the hemodynamic response function and out comes what we would expect the neural response to be. Now we have engineered these sequences so that the wavelets of sequence one and two are much more highly correlated than one and three, and I'll show you that um, in a minute. And then we do this experiment with our subjects um, and we take regions from the activity in the occipital lobe to test our predictions. So our predictions 
um, that the, the coherence between one and two is greater than one and three is illustrated here. This is the correlation. These are the wavelengths um, uh, in periods. And our observation of running um, many, many subjects are consistent with the order uh, that that the correlation is higher with sequences one and two than in one and three. And so we take this little experiment um, as a as as a green light uh, as evidence that we can go ahead and interpret our um, uh, coherence findings as indeed neural coupling. Um, this um, experiment was uh, done by um, Chen Zhang, uh, one of the research scientists in my lab. It is not yet published, but it has been um, it has been submitted. Okay, so um, we we'll go back to the um, experiment I showed you with the timed eye contacts and ask about the coherence between the brains uh, uh, with respect to the TPJ. Now, this experiment was done by Adam Noah in my lab, also an, um, a, a research scientist. And this paper is also uh, submitted um, in review and um, hopefully hopefully about to come out, but not, we're not quite there yet, but it is submitted. Um, so his, the, the finding here is that the um, eye-to-eye -eye contact condition um, has much greater coherence across the two TPJs than the face-to-video condition. And interestingly enough, when we shuffle the partners, this um, coherence actually goes away. And that's evidence for the fact that this is truly a social um, um, event that we're actually measuring. If it wasn't social and if it didn't depend on the two partners, then we uh, wouldn't see it go away. So, um, so it's a nice, nice control um, for that. And so uh, here we see kind of a schematic of what I just shown you that during the eye to eye, the real eye to eye condition, the signals in these two uh, parts of the brain are actually coherent. Now, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as being a little bit odd. We have two parts of the brain. They're not connected. Two parts of two different brains that aren't connected. Why in the world would they be coherent? So we'd like to do a little bit more deeper dive. I don't have an, um, I don't have an answer to that question. And remember I said as I get farther and farther along in this talk, my error bars get larger and larger. And here these error bars are huge. So give me a break. Um, the hypothesis that we're testing here is that maybe, maybe, maybe it has something to do with the eye contact, maybe the fixational eye movements. It may not be eye. It might be face. And we're doing those experiments. I'm not talking about them now. It may be that facial expression and facial dynamics have something to do with driving the coherence between these brains. But the hypothesis right now is that it may be that the fixation eye movements trigger some of the coordinated neural activity. And so our inspiration for this idea comes from a recent paper by Michelle Rucci and Jonathan Victor who have actually shown that these unsteady eye movements, the uh, fixational eye movements, actually do provide a kind of information processing. And that's a necessary factoid if um, uh, this information, if the, the fixational eye movements have anything to do with the coherence between two brains during natural interactive um, eye, eye contact. And so here we are. We're looking in the roadmap here at two people, eye-to-eye -eye contact, free viewing, fixational eye movements, and we're asking questions about are they indeed coherent? And of course, you know where I'm going. I'm going to ask about uh, coherence down here as well. But uh, at this point, um, things get a little bit loose because we don't have quite as much data as we would like. But let me show you what we have. So we go back to our raw data here, uh, eye movement traces. And I'm just, this is the same, the same data that I showed you before. I've just blown it up a little bit differently. And I've taken out uh, S1 just to illustrate with one set of data here. And I've just taken a pinch of five seconds of it. And I'll show you an expanded view. And in this expanded view, I have done 
the wavelet analysis, and so I've decomposed it into wavelets. And I, I want you to pay attention. These relatively low frequency wavelets from the 0.5 to 2.0 um, hertz. Um, here's the original waveform in um, red, and what's covered up with the blue spots is the sum of the wavelets. So you can see that this is doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, so this is very, very, very preliminary data, but when we look at this for our limited number of subjects here, and in this case, I believe we have only nine subjects, so this is really very new. Um, and it may not be true, but this is the, our running hypothesis and our running set of data, is that when we look at the coherence between the eye movements of S1 and S2 during the face video condition, we see that it is generally less than the coherence between the eye movements during the face-to-face -face condition. If this is so, then we might have a link to the fundamental mechanisms that drive brain cross-brain coherence um, during eye-to-eye -eye contact. Um, so we are continuing to work in the space of looking at uh, coherence between fixation eye movements coherence between the FNIR signals that are acquired in this general paradigm. And as I promised you, um, we are now relying heavily on the um, EEG data um, in, this, um, in this context to further um, test these hypotheses. So um, I have to leave you uh, with a work in progress, maybe next year we'll have a lot more information, but I hope this has provides you an example of a hypothesis-based uh, process for using multiple modes of imaging and data processing to ask questions that cannot be asked in any other way. Um, so um, just a, as a summary, uh, combining uh, dual brain imaging in natural conditions um, this in itself, I think, is multimodal. When every time you get two people talking to each other or looking at each other in a skin, uh, for imaging, that's, that's an example of multimodal something. Um, we're using functional near-infrared spectroscopy, um, EEG, eye tracking, and eye movements, um, coherence analysis, particularly wavelets. Uh, we also are doing facial classifications and acoustic recordings for spoken language. We published some of that um, previously. I didn't talk about that today, but I just want to point out that in this general paradigm, there are many other things that we can look at of an interaction nature that are not um, just eye, eye contact. But the bottom line is that um, these FNIRs and two-person paradigms um, can actually be applied for natural social interactions, which is something that I find very satisfying. And that these two, these three methods together, tracking EEG and FNIRs, do provide complementary um, um, information um, and that can hopefully lead to fundamental understandings that neither of them alone can, can do. Um, we um, um, demonstrate here, I think, uh, uh, pretty robustly that the interactive brain hypothesis is supported, that um, Things do happen in the brain when you're in a natural interactive condition that do not happen, happen when not. And so it's a very fruitful area of research, I think. Um, in particular, the right TPJ and angular gyrus is associated with eye-to-eye -eye contact. And by the way, we see similar things with other types of uh, paradigms, such as talking and listening as well. Uh, uh, signals from these regions are coherent across interactive brains. I, we're still exploring the notion that this coherence across brains is actually a hallmark of, of interactive processes, particularly sharing information. Uh, we think that fixational eye movements may also be coherent, but that's um, a big question mark there yet. We're not ready to go online with that. But we do, are very hopeful that findings with a paradigm like this can lead to a mechanistic model or understanding of behavior. Um, that drives neural dynamics um, in live interactive conditions. And so with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge the, the many 
the people in my laboratory. Um, I love this slide because this is a mural of, of the laboratory that was painted by one of, one of my students, uh, Jenny Clark here, um, who was also an art major. And um, when uh, she was a senior, she was asked to uh, paint a mural of what Yale had meant to her. And most of her colleagues, you know, paint these deep, dark, you know, pictures that nobody can understand. But, but, but Jenny comes along and she paints this picture of the lab. Now, this is too funny. This is Swayze in the back with the mirrors doing all the work. This is Adam Noah with wearing his cap on his treadmill, which we have in the lab. This is the, out of the window looking at the Yale campus and all the coffee cups laying around. And for God only knows why she painted me as a blonde. Who knows how that happened? <laughs> but, but any, anyway, and this is the rest of us as uh, we went to the uh, art museum to see her, her artwork. But I think it sort of represents sort of the, the fun that we have in the lab doing these experiments, particularly, look at here, this is Chen. Going, oh my God, I can't believe what they're doing now. Um, this expression, is, we see this a lot. Um, but anyway, this is the team that does all the work, and so I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you. We have time for one brief question. Oh dear, did I go over? I'm sorry. Uh, so really exciting application of multimodal imaging to try to quantify what's happening in real time in a social interaction. I'm wondering, and with the idea that the two brains are interacting uh, and trying to capture that, have you applied this paradigm to a clinical interaction between a patient and a therapist, for example, where eye contact and other aspects of the interaction are part of how the therapy works? A really, really good question. We have that experiment running on, running as we speak. Uh, we have a paradigm set up with uh, the play acting. People are, are are pretending that they are the therapist and 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 changing roles with patients. And we're looking at different aspects of that communication. So it's a very important question. And yes, work in work in progress. Thank you. I'll go to your one two.